Hi there, my name is Stephen Lias and I'm going to be talking you through the clothing and gear that you'll need for your Prince William Sound kayaking trip. In specific, I'm helping out the composers who are part of Composing in the Wilderness and we're traveling in Prince William Sound with Alaska Geographic. But whoever you're traveling with, if you're doing a kayaking trip in Prince William Sound, this will be a very helpful video for you because we'll go through all of the types of clothing and gear that you'll probably want to have with you. So I'm starting with the list that Alaska Geographic gave us, and I'm just going to go through the different categories one by one and show you some examples of what each type of clothing looks like. We're going to start with socks. Their recommendation is that you have four pair of thick socks, wool or synthetic, not cotton. And I'm going to pause right away and talk about the cotton issue. One of the things about backcountry fabrics is that they need to keep you warm. And especially on Prince William Sound, there's the high likelihood that you'll encounter lots of water. There will be water below you and there will likely be water falling from above. And so one of the ways that you stay warm is by not wearing cotton. Synthetic fabrics, if they get wet, will dry quickly and will keep you warm somewhat while they're still wet. Wool also, although it won't be quite as good as when it's dry, it'll still have some warming capability even if it gets wet. But if you get cotton clothing wet, you are wearing a refrigerator. And that's a really dangerous thing to do in an area where hypothermia is one of the major concerns about, about safety. So we recommend, and all companies that run trips into Prince William Sound recommend that you not wear anything cotton. Not your underwear, not a t-shirt, nothing. Nothing cotton in your whole outfit. So you'll notice as you go through your gear list, there are lots of places where it says not cotton. That's why. So let's start with the socks. Here are a typical pair of nice, thick, comfy wool. These are smart wool socks. You can pick these up at any kind of gear outfitter. Um, I would recommend that you get kind of thick socks. It's not a bad idea to have two or three pairs that are slightly different weights. But remember that most of your physical exertion on this trip is going to be your upper body as you kayak. Your feet are going to be sitting in a pair of rubber boots inside a boat that's a foot deep in freezing water. And so since your feet are in a situation where you're not using them a lot and it's a cold environment, having nice thick socks will be really smart. So anything like this, a synthetic or a wool, will, will keep your feet really toasty and you'll be glad you have them. So moving on then to underwear. Again, no cotton underwear for sure. I have a few examples of men's underwear here that run the range from very cheap to more expensive. Uh, these are starter underwear that I got for just a few dollars at Walmart. Again, they're synthetic. You know your taste about how tight or loose you like them. These are some champion underwear that you might get at a Foot Locker or something like that. Academy Sports would have this kind of underwear. Uh, if you want to go up uh, to a higher level, uh, these ex officio backpacking underwear, really high tech fabric that wicks moisture away really quickly but keeps its strength up and and you can wear it for days and days and days and then uh, sort of top of the line for men would be these tommy john go anywhere briefs also you can wear these for a week at a time and they still feel like they just came out of the dryer really comfortable really supportive wick moisture away from you uh, in women's underwear you would be uh, smart to wear something synthetic on the bottom, whatever you're comfortable with, not cotton. And then if you want to just Google synthetic sports bra, that's a very good thing to, uh, to have two or three of for a week-long kayaking trip. So that's about it for the underwear. Let's move to our list says two to three long underwear bottoms or running tights. Let me show you some base layer bottoms. The number one thing is those waffle long johns that you often will see in Walmart and places like that, those are mostly cotton. So you can't wear those. You're gonna to wanna to get something that's polypro or propylene. Uh, this is a really nice pair from Patagonia. They fit a little bit loose on me and I like that quite a lot. Remember that the thing that keeps you warm is the air in between you and the outside. And so the more space there is for air, the warmer you'll be. So actually having something that's got a little bit of looseness to it will trap more air than something that's absolutely skin tight. 
Then if I move up to a slightly thicker one, these are also a nice, fairly thick uh, synthetic long john material. Works really well. This is a, a finely spun wool, not much thicker than this one, but really warm if you know that your legs run cold and you want something to make sure that you stay warm with. These are really terrific. And then this is a woman's pair. These are really sort of micro fleece. If you can see the inside of that is a micro fleece lining, but they're entirely synthetic and they would fit pretty skin tight and keep you really nice and warm. Let's move on now to the long sleeve base layer. It's the next thing on our list. We've talked about uh, base layer on the bottom. We're going to talk about the base layer on the top now. This says two to three long sleeve base layer or long underwear top, synthetic, not cotton. And I have some examples here, uh, both men's and women's. Let's start with women's. This is a uh, typical base layer that you might wear skiing. So that's one good option. Here's another really great option in a women's. It's a what we would call a quarter zip base layer, all synthetic, very comfortable to wear all day long. I have the same thing in men's. I wear that all the time when I'm in Alaska. And then I have also a quarter zip from REI. This is a, a black one that's got a little stretch to it. I like this so much that I bought all of them that they had left in the whole country. Lots of options in these, but you want it to be comfortable and not too terribly hot. All right, let's move on to one pair of nylon shorts. Now, you're very welcome to just bring a easily packable pair of the kind of shorts you might wear to the gym. That's a good option. If you have something with pockets, like this ex officio pair of shorts, that's also just fine. Just make sure that they're synthetic and not cotton. However, if you have a pair of those zip-off convertible quick-dry pants, that's also a good option. This would be a great item for both shorts and the next item, which is one pair quick-dry hiking style pants. So if I had these along, I wouldn't need to bring a pair of shorts at all. This is a men's REI brand, slightly more substantial hiking pant, not quite as heavy as a soft shell, but uh, pretty substantial. And so this would also be a really great quick drying pant option. Moving on then to warm fleece pants. These might be something you would wear in camp, and they also might be something that you would wear underneath rain pants if you're gonna paddle on a day when it's rainy. What's next on our list? Two quick dry shirts, and they recommend one short sleeved and one long sleeved, and they go ahead and say again, no cotton. Again, there are lots of options in this. This is just like an athletic workout shirt, but it's all synthetic, it dries really quickly. Then there are more standard button-up shirts. This is a woman's, and here's a Magellan men's similar style button-up, sort of a fishing shirt. Another option that you might find is this, another one of my favorite shirts. It's very comfortable, long-sleeved, completely synthetic, and it's got a little hood on it. The next item on our gear list is two fleece jackets or wool sweaters, or one of each. This is basically an insulating layer. It's something that you would have on uh, to keep you warm underneath a rain jacket if it was raining or if it was windy, and sometimes not underneath a rain jacket. So there are lots of options. Here's a women's nice half zip sweater, which is wool. Wool works great for this sort of thing. Here is a higher end option which is what I would call a half zip puffy shirt. This is a North Face brand item. The whole thing collapses down into its own pocket. So you end up with a little puffy ball this size when you're not using it. And it's really lightweight. So you get a lot of warming capability and not a lot of space with a shirt like this. And then some more basic options, the sort of thing that you might just get at Academy or Walmart, a zip up fleece like this. Really easy to find, a kind of an insulating layer, a half zip or a full zip. 
and fleece uh, that will keep you nice and warm. Last thing on the inner layer of clothing list are one pair warm gloves, wool or fleece, not cotton. And then it says for camp, not paddling. Your guide will generally provide you with paddling gloves. Those are more specific for, uh, for the wet weather. But, um, but for in camp, you would want something like this, which is really an insulator glove designed to go under something else. This is an entirely fleece glove. And then if you want something slightly waterproof in case it's raining, this is an option designed for winter weather. And you see it's got a uh, water repellent outer layer to it. Any of these would be terrific options. Along with the gloves, the other thing that they say is one to two buff neck gaiters or bandana. Um, you get extra points if your buff has the Alaska Geographic logo on it. Um, but this is a buff. If you don't know what a buff is, it is a long tube of fabric that can be worn in a bunch of different ways, as a neck gaiter, as a little hood, as a nightcap, any number of things. They're terrific, they're very helpful, uh, and they come in all different colors and styles and thicknesses. So that gets us through the inner layer of clothing portion of the list. Moving on to the outer layer now, one of the most common things you'll want is a nice puffy jacket. And I've got a couple of options here, uh, just a Patagonia puff jacket. Most of these have a pocket that you can kind of fold the whole jacket down into. This is a Brooks Range jacket. Unfortunately, you can't get this anymore. It's just a half zip jacket with a hood on it. But next on our list of outer layer materials, one pair synthetic backpacking style rain pants. I have a variety of options I want to show you here. What they're describing is basically this. These happen to be women's backpacking pants that I wear because I'm a small guy and it's hard to find rain pants that fit. One of the things I really like is a pair of rain pants that have a full side zip. So these pants can be zipped all the way down and that way you can put them on no matter what you've got on already. If it starts to rain, you need to get into them quickly. You don't have to take anything off or, or worry about anything. They're um, a little more expensive, but they're really, really useful because of that little side zip. A few of you may have been kayaking before, sea kayaking or some other kind of uh, river or, st or still water kayaking. And if you have a pair of kayaking pants, you are very welcome to bring those. These differ in that they generally have elastic and Velcro at the ankles to tighten down at the ankle so that you're not letting water in around the edges. They're usually slightly more water repellent than just a basic rain pant and they can work very well. If you've got them, bring them. If you don't, the regular rain pants along with a more rubberized uh, sort of fisherman style rain gear that the, the outfitter will provide will be perfectly fine. Moving on then, the rain jacket. Here is a men's and women's rain jacket, one from Marmot and one from the North Face. Uh, th these will be really useful. Rain gear is so important. If you've been kayaking before and you have a kayaking top, has a nice Velcro cinch around the neck so that you can tighten up the neck. Same thing around the sleeves. So if you have one of these, you're welcome to bring it. If you're using this trip as an excuse to buy cool stuff, then something like this would also be really great. I have one comment about this, and that is if you are wearing a kayaking top like that this cinches tight at the neck, then you're gonna need, in addition to whatever other hat you have, you're gonna need something like this Outdoor Research Urban Sombrero because this doesn't have a hood on it. And when it rains a lot, you need a wide waterproof brim if you don't have a hood on your jacket to keep yourself nice and dry. Next on our list is two warm wool or fleece hats, one for daytime, one for sleeping. I have a variety of hats here. This one is a wool knit um, basic hat, not too thick, but really great for keeping you warm on a chilly day. If you want a full on fleece hat, 
Uh, this is much warmer. You get extra points as usual if your fleece hat has the Alaska Geographic logo on it. Ooh. Uh, I like to sleep in a little micro fleece beanie. Uh, it's way less uh, constricting and hot than this. I tend to get too hot in a real fleece or wool hat at night, but something like this is really great. But I would also say that buff that I showed you earlier works great as a sleep hat to keep your ears and head warm if you need it to. And then if you happen to have a balaclava that you want to bring, these are not a bad idea. Um, it might be a little bit of overkill for a trip like this, but underneath, like on a rainy day, underneath a rain hood, this can be really nice to keep your ears warm uh, and keep the weather out. The next thing on the list is one baseball or sun cap. I've already shown you the Urban Sombrero. This would work great as a sun cap if you want it to, if you have something like that along. A regular baseball cap, as long as it's not cotton, would be a good idea. I like this, uh, this split bill hat because it's very comfortable. It's made of all synthetic material and it folds down flat in my luggage so I don't crunch up the bill when I pack it. One of the things I like about this one. But any baseball cap uh, will work. Uh, or sun cap if you've got a paddling cap that you like with a big brim and they, some of them have the fabric that hangs down behind. Those are great. They also make, uh, Marmot makes and some other companies as well, a waterproof baseball cap with a fleece lining. Kind of a nice combination for this kind of activity and it keeps the rain rolling right off your head. All right, next on our list is one pair of under knee rubber boots and they list extra tough or equivalent, AKA rain boots. You might think of these as muck boots. Extra tough is the brand that's kind of the unofficial uniform of Alaska. Um, and here is a pair, these are not extra tough, but they're a typical sort of muck boot. Uh, that you might run across. I got these for almost nothing at Walmart. Um, you will wear these much of the time while you're paddling in Prince William Sound. You'll wear them in the boat. You'll often wear them in camp. You may wa wear them on little hikes. Uh, and so you want to get something that fits well and that is comfortable. Make sure it is a little bit big, uh, but not uncomfortably so. You want it big enough to wear thick socks. And if you have a favorite insole that you use, every pair of shoes I have, has these green super feet insoles in them. And so if you have an insole that you prefer, make sure there's room in your rubber boot for those insoles as well. These are bulky and heavy. And so I am in discussion with our outfitter about whether we can either rent them in Anchorage or whether they can be borrowed from Alaska Geographic. Many of the other guides uh, in Prince William Sound also will provide you with a loner pair of extra tufts. So I'll let you know whether you need to bring your own or not. Don't rush out and buy them. But if you already have some that you like, might be worth bringing them along even though they're bulky and heavy because then you won't have to go potluck on whether the ones that they're loaning you will fit you. The last thing on our clothing list is a pair of camp shoes. There are quite a variety of directions you can go with this. Our list says, Sneakers, Crocs, Chacos, or light hiking boots. All of these are good options. This is my current favorite camp shoe. It's a, basically an insulated slipper with rain shedding uh, treatment on the outside. So it feels like a slipper on the inside, but it's got a nice heavy rubber sole on the outside and water repellency. So in camp, it's really terrific to be in these rather than boots or hiking shoes. I wouldn't go hiking in these, but they're terrific for walking around on stone beaches. Uh, these are very similar to Chaco's. These are Keens if you want a more open shoe option. Won't be quite as useful in the rain, but uh, would be very comfortable and make sure that they're big enough for your extra thick socks underneath that. And another interesting option would be uh, just a pair of super cheap plastic flip-flops and either your thick socks or if it's raining, you might consider some neoprene socks. These are nice, thick Magellan neoprene on the outside and a fleece layer on the inside. They're very comfortable and uh, you could wear these inside your muck boots in the boat, but you could also wear these in camp 
in the evening with a pair of flip-flops and even if it was drizzling, the rain wouldn't bother you. Moving on now to the other gear that you'll need other than clothing. The first thing on the list is a sleeping bag. This is my current uh, favorite sleeping bag, a North Face bag that's rated down to 20 degrees. Remember that this is a wet trip. In other words, you are traveling in boats. There is the potential for capsizing. There is the potential for uh, rain. And so all of the things that might get wet must be synthetic. Down sleeping bags are wonderful, but if they get wet, not only do they not keep you warm, but they take forever to dry out. And so a sleeping bag must be synthetic on this trip. There's no two ways about that. Our outfitter will allow you to rent a sleeping bag from them. It's actually a loaner, but the only fee is that you'll have to pay a small dry cleaning fee. If you don't like the psychological barrier of sleeping in a sleeping bag that dozens of other strangers have slept in, then you might also want to consider a sleeping bag liner. This is a synthetic or sometimes silk uh, bag liner that just fits inside your sleeping bag. Uh, it adds roughly 10 degrees of warming capability as well. So if you have a 30 degree bag that you're bringing and want to make sure you can get it down to the 20 degrees that they recommend, you might also get a bag liner. Our gear list does not talk about pillows. There are a number of ways of handling this. If you have a uh, inflatable backpacking pillow that you like. These are terrific. This is my current favorite. Blows up in four puffs. Another way of doing it is to bring a stuff sack. There are a few different companies that make regular stuff sacks that you would be using for your belongings. Maybe you keep all your underwear and long johns in this. And then in your tent, you turn it inside out and it's got a nice sort of uh, micro fleecy interior and when you turn it up inside out and put your clothes inside it then you've got a small pillow that's also an excellent option if you want to just bring a pillowcase with you and then stuff a puffy coat or whatever other clothes you have inside a pillowcase that also makes an excellent pillow the one thing that i don't recommend is that you bring an actual little pillow because those don't smush down very small. And remember, we're gonna have limited space in the boats and everything's gonna to have to go in all these dry bags. So you want something that's gonna smush down very nicely. And that's why both of these options are very good. For a sleeping pad, there are both inflatable options and closed cell options. I'll show you one of each. Uh, this is an inexpensive thermarest. It's not particularly thick, which means that if the ground is rocky or uneven, those rocks are going to poke up a little bit through this. Its lack of thickness also means that it doesn't uh, keep your body quite as far away from the cold ground. But these are very inexpensive. You can see they accordion down into a relatively small packet. So that's uh, one good option. My favorite sleeping pad right now is this inflatable, which is a Sea to Summit inflatable. It's got two air chambers, one on the top and one on the bottom, and it elevates you a good inch and a half, two inches off of the cold ground. And because it's full of air, air is a really great insulator, so it keeps you a little bit warmer. On a trip like this, I don't think there's a lot of danger of it getting punctured. Uh, it's going to be in a dry bag dirt while you're in the boat, and most of the places we'll be camping will be uh, like coastal stones uh, or spongy tundra. So I would feel pretty good about bringing an inflatable if you have one that you like. If you don't have any kind of sleeping pad, uh, then Alaska Geographic has agreed to loan you a sleeping pad as well. Uh, so again, if you want to save luggage space, uh, you don't need to bring a sleeping bag or a sleeping pad and you can rent those from Alaska Geographic. The next thing on our list is a contractor trash bag to line the sleeping bag stuff sack for waterproofing. The most important thing in terms of waterproofing is the thickness and sturdiness of the plastic bag that you use. So a contractor bag is usually about two mil thick. If you just go for the hefty bags in the grocery store aisle, you're gonna have a real hard time finding the two mil thick ones. 
But another thing that your grocery store will carry that you might not think to look for are trash compactor bags. When you line whatever the dry bag is that's gonna hold your sleeping bag, putting your sleeping bag inside this, cinching it down really good, and then putting that inside a dry bag is the smart way to go. Having a few extra of these kinds of bags along is very, very smart. Uh, you're gonna have dirty, wet clothes that you need to deal with along the way. Uh, and you may need to sort of improvise a pack cover. I'll show you how to do that in a few minutes. These trash compactor bags are really the way to go on that. Next on our list, around camp, they suggest one small camp stool or butt pad. This is optional, but being in camp and sitting on the ground is sometimes a bit of a drag. So uh, here are two options. This is just a three-legged stool. Packs down into a small size that's easy to get into a boat. So that's option number one. Option number two I've got here is this A-Lite chair. And it explodes into a, uh, a little chair that has a seat and a back to it. And I find these very comfortable and you can see they've been engineered to also close down into a very small space. They list a waterproof watch with an alarm. I can assure you that we will wake you up. We won't leave you behind. So uh, if you don't happen to have an alarm on your watch, that's not a crisis. Two one liter water bottles. Uh, I just have two examples here. Most bottles have this Nalgene sized top on them. This is kind of the standard. I think it's smart when you're on a river or a water trip to have a top on the bottle that you can put a carabiner on and then attach it, run a rope through that so that if the boat capsizes, you're not going to lose your water bottle. And as always, you get extra points for having the Alaska Geographic logo Ooh. on any of your paraphernalia. Moving on, one pair of sunglasses with a strap. Uh, make sure that you've got some sort of strap on the back end of your sunglasses. Uh, going on down the list, your toiletry bag. I'm not going to run you through all of the necessary toiletries. Any outfitter that you work with is going to give you a really great list of these. They ask that you put it in a quart size Ziploc bag. That would be one of these. And while we're talking about Ziploc bags, I will say please use the zipper kind with the actual zipper at the top that slides back and forth rather than just the pinch to close kind. This is important actually because you're gonna be smushing all this stuff down into a dry bag. And when you use one of these and you start to smush, it inevitably pops open and then water can get in. And so if you use one of these, you have the ability to squeeze all the air out, zip it shut, and then it'll, it'll smush down well without popping open. Uh, you're welcome to bring along some extras, both of that size and of a, a larger size like this. These are great as, as ditty bags. We'll be talking about that more in just a moment. But you're gonna to wanna to put all of your toiletries in a small Ziploc or a closable waterproof toiletry case. Our list includes toothbrush, travel size toothpaste, hand sanitizer, sunscreen, lip balm, travel size bug repellent. We will give you some of that. Uh, pack of wet wipes. I would urge you to pick those up as well. Moving on, it says one pair of earplugs. You're gonna be traveling in close quarters with strangers and some of them will snore. Maybe you will snore. So we, we go ahead and provide everyone with earplugs. If you wanna bring some of your own because you know you have some that work for you, that's great. But we do provide everyone with earplugs because we know you're gonna be with strangers. Going on further down the list, one headlamp or small flashlight. I, I certainly would urge you to consider the headlamp option rather than the flashlight option. Uh, a headlamp means that your hands are free. And so whatever you're doing, you can point the light directly at it and it's incredibly helpful. Uh, a bug head net will give you one. Don't worry about that. Uh, you will want one though. If you're on someone else's trip, make sure that either you bring a bug head net uh, or that they're gonna give one to you. They recommend a small knife or multi-tool. Uh, just be aware of where you pack it so that you don't get in trouble with TSA. Uh, cameras in watertight case. Try not to bring a huge amount of camera equipment. We're in boats with limited capacity. So uh, a camera that's small 
is better than a camera that's big. Also, be conscious that we are paddling in salt water. Salt water is corrosive to camera gear, and so you're going to want to be very, very careful with your camera gear. A small day pack for hiking around. We will do a little bit of hiking, and there are a variety of options that you can use for this. Let me show you some of those options. Here's what I will be using. This is a little day pack, very lightweight, and I bought a pack cover for it that fits over the pack. Uh, if we go for a little hike in the rain, it's nice to be able to cover up all of your belongings so that they're not going to get wet. The thing about this pack is that there's no rigid parts to it. It's floppy. So when I mush it down into a dry bag, it goes into a small space and doesn't mess up the bag. This is an important consideration. If you bring an old book bag or, or shoulder bag, make sure that it can close down into a very small space. You're not going to be using this a lot, so it doesn't have to be a trail-sized backpack. Another option, this is a really spacious fanny pack with a pretty good substantial waist strap. So it's got good support that you can cinch in and it's got lots and lots of storage space. This would be a, a very good option for our little day hikes. We're not gonna go that far and this would easily fit some snacks and your rain gear and a couple of water bottles. And then if you don't wanna spend a lot of money and you do have just a cheapo kind of uh, school book bag, this would be just fine. It's roll upable, uh, so it doesn't take up much space. And if you're going to bring something like this that's not really designed to be used in the rain, you can take some bungee cord, which you can get at Hobby Lobby or Walmart, and a barrel clip, and then use one of these trash compactor bags and just slap it over top of this with a bungee cord and a barrel clip at the bottom, and you've got yourself a inexpensive pack cover for an inexpensive pack. Then they talk about dry bags. I just want to show you some dry bag options here. Dry bags are all designed the same and they run from very small to very large and uh, they all work this way. You put your stuff inside them and then you roll down the top and snap it closed. You will be provided from your outfitter, you will get some big dry bags to use, something like this and certainly something like this. You'll have some of these given to you by your outfitter. And you don't necessarily have to bring these unless you have some that you already like. Smaller ones uh, that are designed just to hold clothing or a sleeping bag or uh, you know socks and underwear. These are terrific to have along. You notice that I write my name on the back of all of them so that when I go on a trip, I know what belongs to me and what doesn't. Uh, but what you don't want to do is bring these kinds of backpacking ditty bags that just have drawstrings at the top because these are not water resistant in any way. So you want every layer of your packing to have water resistance to it and to be able to seal down by rolling and clasping like this. You're welcome to use a big Ziploc instead of a dry bag this size. Ziplocs are great, um, but if you're going to use this as an excuse to buy cool things, these are nice. Optional gear. Uh, we're coming down to this home stretch here. Ziploc bags we've talked about. Extra trash bags we've talked about. Uh, personal snacks, same would be true on any trip. If you have something that you absolutely love to have or your favorite uh, energy bar or something, we'll give you an opportunity to pick that up or you can bring it with you. If you know that you run cold, then maybe bring some hand warmers. We are in Alaska. It is August, so yeah, that's early fall in Alaska. It could be any temperature at all. It could be sunny, it could be rainy, it could be cold. Uh, we just don't know. So having some along is never a bad idea and they don't take up a lot of space. Uh, a book to read during downtime, uh, again, probably a physical book is safer than a Kindle because of the saltwater corrosiveness. I've had Kindles get ruined by saltwater, so watch out for that. 
our outfitter is going to provide you with everything you need, the, the paddles, the kayaks, the safety gear, uh, paddling mittens. They will also provide tents. Now, if you have your own tent that you just love, by all means, you are welcome to bring it. It should be a small backpacking sized tent. Be aware that you can use their tents for free. And so if you want to minimize the amount of wear and tear you put on your own tent that you like very much, you might want to leave it at home and use their tent. It's okay with me if you bring your own tent though. Uh, they will provide all of the cooking utensils and they'll provide all the food and snacks along the way. And that's our whole gear list. So whether you're traveling with us and composing in the wilderness through Alaska Geographic or whether you're traveling with one of the other terrific companies in southern Alaska, hopefully this guide will run you through all of the basic things that you need for your upcoming adventure in Prince William Sound.